on. Very good. We're glad you guys are here. Um, look, been looking forward to this opportunity to share uh, with you um, some of our most uh, important churches that we have the chance to work with, uh, churches that we really feel like are uh, shaping the story of what's happening in the church. Um, and so we look forward to the opportunity to be involved with you in many ways, but this is just one of the things we wanted to provide for you. And it's an opportunity to hear directly from Warren Bird, our director of research, who um, has done some really excellent research um, around the megachurch and in, in many different ways and many different uh, capacities. Uh, but today we're going to have the opportunity to hear a little bit, uh, some of the key learnings from his most recent research. He'll do about 15 or 20 minutes uh, presentation, and then we will have some time for Q&A and, and a little bit of opportunity to interact with him. So, Warren, welcome, and I uh, appreciate your being with us today as well. Thank you, Greg, and I'm going to look for the screen share. Oh, there it is. Uh, so I'm going to get a little bit smaller, and uh, we'll fly through. Uh, you've we are all seeing each other, and if you'll click your microphone off just in case you have a loud background noise, then we'll, uh, we'll have you rejoin at the Q&A time. Um, I want to thank you. Uh, like once or so a year, I do a big research project so that I can determine trends. Right now, we're in the middle of the salary, staffing, and budget, large churches uh, only. Uh, all of you would qualify at leadnet.org slash salary. But this one was a survey we did uh, in the fall of last year. On very large churches, I did it in conjunction with the other leading uh, scholar on uh, large churches, Scott Thema. And uh, so here are some of the things we found. Well, first of all, here's Greg Ligon and myself as their co-presenters. And uh, so what did we learn? Uh, first, I think you're aware that four out of five churches in America in general, uh, Protestant churches, are plateaued or declining. And by significant contrast, not only are very large churches growing, and, uh, and by the word megachurch, we mean 2,000 or more attenders, adults and children, all physical campuses combined on a typical weekend, and they are growing not just slowly, but at fast rates, so anything you've heard about, oh, mega large churches are just a baby boomer thing. Uh, <laughs> not at all. Uh, there are more at, of them. They are growing uh, at fast rates and uh, they are proliferating. Uh, so that's a quick overview. Um, so we actually did the same survey that, um, that, a, that all other churches, Protestant churches did. So in some places, at least the first part, we're going to compare how mega churches differ with uh, churches below 2,000, and that is in no way to put down God's wonderful work in churches of all sizes or to say that larger churches are better. But hey, it's nice to know, it's helpful to know what, what's unique or distinctive about uh, your size of church. Your size of church is half of 1%. Uh, which is the 1,650 megachurches out of 300,000 churches total. But last weekend, 10% of people who went to a Protestant church went to a megachurch. So of large churches, uh, when we gave you six choices about how do you describe your worship for large churches, the word inspirational was on top. That's neither good nor bad. That's just the way it is. Interestingly, for smaller churches, Filled with a sense of God's presence. The second to bottom slide uh, was the largest choice. Um, something to think about. Uh, this, I found, was overwhelming. When we ask how clear is, how would you rate the clarity of your church's mission and purpose? And you got four choices. The one at the end is strongly agree. Almost 80%, four out of five, said that we strongly agree it's got a clear mission and purpose. Interestingly, other sized churches were almost half that amount in their sense of, of agreement. That's significant in part because there's a direct relationship between clarity of vision and growth rate. And in fact, uh, when we polled a lot of uh, pastors a couple of years ago, what book besides the Bible is on your nightstand, simple church was, because the, the longer you go as a large church, the more stuff you do, and you can do most things well, and it's easy to accumulate, and the more pastors are saying, no, we've got to stay focused 
what is it that we're all about as a church? You see the other comparisons, spiritually vital and alive, is different from con other congregations in our community, and is willing to meet new challenges. Now, we're going to come back to that uh, figure later on, the bottom one. Right now, you see that large churches way outrank smaller churches in their willingness to change, to adjust, as the culture, the gospel, the Jesus, the Bible never change, but the culture we're trying to reach with the gospel does, uh, and we'll come back to that idea. Um, there are a whole lot of younger, large churches. So we sliced them in half between those that are founded in 1990 up to the present. So that'd be 15 years, uh, I'm sorry, 25 years or younger versus those found before. And not much surprise uh, other than that the younger, the newer the church, the faster growing they tend to be. They tend to have a younger pastor so that they have more people closer to that pastor's age. By the way, the average church is the senior pastor's uh, life's age minus about five years. Now, you can dilute that by having a teaching team that spans generations. Uh, that brings the average age down as the senior pastor grows a year older or having worship team leaders or other platform presence. Uh, but the younger the senior leader in general, the more uh, young adults present. Uh, as you might guess, the older the church, the longer the senior pastor's been around. They tend to be a little larger in worship, tend to have a little more developed giving capacity. And that may not be because people are more generous. It may be just because of a different life stage in that the average 30-year-old who tithes probably isn't giving the same thing as the average 50-year-old who tithes. So there's your giving per capita. And by the way, when, when those who take the salary survey, we're going to give you all kinds of giving per capita ratios and how does that change? How does that affect your neighborhood and compare with your neighborhood in, in particular uh, to help give you some more benchmarks? So the number of multi-site churches continues to grow dramatically. Look just from the year 2000 when one out of four were multi-site to the year 2015 when, when two out of three are multi-site and there is no let up in that growth. Of the 19 largest, uh, nine out of the 10 largest church attendance churches are multi-site. The one that's not is uh, Lakewood, Joel Olstein, which has the 16,000 seat compact center that they turn around four times, Saturday night, one, two on Sunday morning, and one on Sunday afternoon. But they're kind of maxed out, um, even if they fill all of that. So this slide is a little bit uh, challenging to understand. In essence, of those we ask about spiritual vitality, we also ask about the centrality of small groups. Uh, large churches grow bigger by getting smaller. And when we ask how central is uh, some kind of small group system to the spiritual health of your church, 72% uh, said it was central, the, the, the highest choice, and then the vast majority of others had the second highest choice. But then when we correlated that with vitality, we found a clear relationship that the more strongly you agree we're vital, the more likely small groups are to be central to your strategy of discipleship and Christian formation. So we also uh, asked, do you have online worship services? Uh, and and uh, of those who view themselves as innovative, uh, this is the percentages that have online services or are not or are thinking about it. Interestingly, when online first happened, everybody seemed to jump on it, and then there was a backing off. We noticed uh, over a number of years, and my sense is that in recent years, more and more churches are trying an intentionality far beyond just broadcasting their service, but um, but staffing it with uh, staff and volunteers to uh, do prayer requests, uh, giving. Uh, I'm surprised at how many online churches, talk, churches with online campuses, talk about the amazingly high giving rate of people who come through those services. That I don't understand, uh, but uh, that's, that's the, the stat. So another thing we found was that um, churches with a higher emphasis on missions see, surprisingly, higher financial giving. So, you know, it's easy to... Th to think, well, if we emphasize things beyond our wall, won't that dilute the income that 
comes to the church, and that's that's probably not the most spiritual thinking, but most of us are very capable of <laughs> of asking that question. Uh, but in reality, uh, the higher, as you see on the right-hand column, the higher you say global mission is our church's specialty, the more likely you are to have a far higher giving per capita. And again, if you have questions on any of these, we're going to come back and you can just say, hey, Warren, show me that, you know, uh, giving slide or whatever, and I can just slip back to it as we have our discussion. Um, what about becoming more diverse racially? Predictably, multi-site churches are more diverse than uh, their single-site counterparts. But what we don't know is, is that because, you know, the downtown one is heavily Hispanic and the, the one on the east side is uh, heavily uh, Asian because there's an Asian community there. Uh, are the different uh, ethnicities truly mixing? Or <laughs> you, you, you may be aware that, that the larger the church, the more likely it is to be more, more multi-ethnic. That's a fact, but what we don't know is when you zoom down to that church, is it that, you know, the Filipinos all gather in their Bible study fellowship and uh, African Americans tend to cluster together? That we don't know, but we do know that uh, for the big room, uh, it's the most diverse of any size church. So uh, looking more at the finances, while the perception of financial help has increased, um, if you compare it to dollars adjusted for inflation, since 2000, the giving is really not higher. Um, and if your church is typical of most churches, a third who attend give nothing, a third give less than $500 uh, a year, and a third give the rest of the giving for the church. The average tithe uh, for church-going Americans is about 3%, which is down from uh, previous years, and that too has affected large churches. Their, uh, their ability to do more is in part fueled by their growth, which means more people, which means after a while, those people give financially, and uh, that helps continue to uh, grow the budget uh, so the church can do more things. So here's a really significant trend that you've probably heard about, but we documented that your regular participants are attending less often. Uh, I grew up in an era when I remember as a child, people wearing a perfect attendance pen uh, at church uh, because they were there 52 Sundays. And now even your most involved people are there like three out of four weekends at most, somewhere between two and three, and uh, uh, somewhere between two and three uh, weekends a month, which, you know, you think, okay, I made this big presentation on Sunday, and my core group, if no one else heard it, no, they didn't. <laughs> uh, a good third of your core group probably wasn't there that week. Uh, now, maybe a few of them will see it catch up online, but uh, don't assume that, uh, just because you've said something once or emailed it once that uh, everybody's connected. This has, it's even worse, the numbers are, for children's ministry. Uh, that, you know, how do I have a, a training? I was just with Andy Stanley and his senior leader team and the, the, the children's director said, my average is just over one out of two. So how in the world can I maintain the relationship, have a progression of curriculum if we're if the kids are coming only every other week, that's a great question and uh, a big challenge to solve. Now, uh, do large churches, let's go up the age to young adults. Large churches still lead the way in reaching young adults, especially the newer large churches, which tend to be kind of mono-generational. Uh, so do they have the same percentage of young adults as in the population around those churches? No. Do they have um, uh, the highest percentage of reaching young adults of any size church? Yes, large churches are the place that young adults go. And this may be not be rocket science, but there was a clear correlation between the more you emphasize young adults and are intentional about reaching them, the more show up at your church. Now, some... Uh, 
possible concerns. Uh, first, megachurches are engaging less frequently with other churches. They tend not to do partnerships, uh, and I don't know why, but that's the, the reality, and there are some numbers that uh, help show you the uh, clear decline in, uh, in different activities, whether it's worship, uh, educational, fellowship, or community service. Um, Mega churches are also, again, that's attendance of 2,000 and higher. Uh, and if you're not 2,000, we actually did a special report, which is uh, on our website. Go to leadnet.org slash megachurches for churches that are in the 1,000 to 1999 category. The big picture is a lot of this is very similar for you, maybe not as pronounced, but we did one just on trends of that size church. Anyway. Uh, large churches decline in level of willingness to meet new challenges. That's that nimbleness and flexibility that is so essential for uh, as the culture moves, continuing to connect well with the gospel, with the unchanging, uh, uh, connect well with the community, with the unchanging gospel. Uh, so you see quite a mark from 2005 where we did the same survey every five years. And yes, we being overachievers, we, we did it in 2008 as well. But you can see the clear progression of, uh, of large churches not as willing, still more willing than smaller churches, but not as willing. Now, this one may really concern you. When we ask, you know, is your church uh, spiritually vital and alive? And again, there's one person who's filling out the survey on behalf of the church, and whatever that person's perceptions, whether they're lying or, or being more uh, um, uh, circumspect and uh, less optimistic, we, we can assume kind of a consistency of, uh, of uh, truth-telling and accuracy across the board. And uh, to that question, when we ask each time, are you spiritually vital and alive? And again, on a four-point scale, the item number four, I strongly agree that our church is. Um, you see a noticeable decline over the years in that. A few more slides. Um, large church clarity of mission and purpose remains high. Uh, that should be encouraging. But contrast that, and I'm sorry for any long-term pa pastors, we are not picking on you, but, but when you're – you know, long is preached, the longer you are in a church, the more effective your ministry. That's absolutely true. But there are certain downsides that begin to occur at about the 20-year mark with the same church. And one of those is your perception of the church's vitality. Uh, and I hope you're all the exception to the norm. But here's the norm. It tends to go down. Uh, the older the pastor, the more likely to be the pastor of the church's growth era, which is good. And overall, when we ask churches, is when you cross the 2000 barrier, was it under your present senior pastor, Ginghamsburg being a case in point here and probably many others, uh, the answer 82% said yes, but um, that pastor is predictably still there and aging. Uh, so how do they rate their planning for succession at whatever state is appropriate to how old the pastor is now? Just over half uh, say it's good to better. And by the way, we're doing a succession large church planning thing. If you know of someone who wants to anticipate how to prepare the culture of the church for that in a few years, go to leadnet.org slash succession. Uh, Oops. Uh, there we go. Ha. Let's try this again. The older the megachurch pastor, the more prepared for pastoral succession when it occurs. That's a good thing. Uh, oh, and that's it. So, Greg, you want to you wanna lead some questions? We tried to whiz through, and I'd love to come back to anything that uh, you'd like to ask more about. And here's Greg Ling. <laughs> you bet. Um, floor's open, so you can unmute your mic and get any questions uh, for Warren. Uh, please uh, jump in. As he said, we can jump back to any of the slides um, if you have a question about those. Uh, but uh, love to hear your questions, thoughts, feedback. 
I have a question about the slide after you were talking about mega churches engaging with other churches in their community. And then I feel like you had another slide. I could be wrong about it, about engagement in the community. Could you talk more about that slide? It was like low at 37%. Yeah, I will go back to that. And it's Rachel, right? Yeah. Um, this whole presentation with commentary, if you go to leadnet.org slash mm -hmm. megachurch, uh, it's, it's on there. And that will, if you want to look, uh, study the, the slides in more detail. Let's see, share screen. Is this it? Yes, there we are. And we're going to go from current slide. And let's just fly back. Yeah, the, the one before. Just previous. This was young adults. Oh, keep going. Keep going it, forward. It was the one that had 37% um, at the bottom. There we go. Yeah. Okay, so oh, that, yeah. that's not a community engagement. That's okay. Just, um, Personal challenges within the... Yeah, in essence, the ability of a church to change and its willingness to change is a key predictor of its future growth. Um, the idea, you know, we found the winning formula. We just, you know, the train track is in front of us. We just keep the train on the track. Uh, rarely works as your neighborhood changes, as the culture changes. And uh, so we find that the more churches say they are willing to meet new challenges, the more likely they are to also be innovative, spiritually vital, and frankly growing. Hey, Warren, um, on that one, is there any correlation uh, between um, age of pastor or tenure of pastor yes. or age of church? Yeah, that's what I was trying to show in the, uh, in the slide of the spiritual vitality and this one in particular. Okay. Uh, so so uh, the tan bar, and I kind of flew through this one, is people who describe their church as as innovative and would say it innovative describes their church very well, meaning the top mm -hmm. choice. Uh, and you see that's, that's definitely age related. And then the blue bar is those who say, who strongly agree again, four point scale, you pick the top one that their church is willing to change to meet new challenges. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a good question. It's a sobering. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. And again, I hope you are all the exception. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it may be a good, um, and it may be a good um, diagnostic question to ask in the succession process. You mm -hmm. know, in terms of timing for that, in terms of for us for a for a senior pastor to be able to self evaluate, you know, their willingness to risk and to accept challenge and. And uh, that may be a determining factor in, in when they should begin their succession process. Yes, no, maybe. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Warren? Uh, I agree. And uh, I also agree that the senior pastor's senior team tends to be, unless they're very intentional, roughly the same age group. And so the older the senior pastor, the more important to involve that not only a Gen X or millennial in a key uh, voice role and also a key voice role in giving feedback on the messages, you know, did this connect with your generation or at least with you and your friends? How could we have said it in a way that uh, spoke better? That's good. Other questions, observations, feedback? Yeah, Greg, uh, Joe Champion. Dr. Warren, do you think with the multi-site and the campuses throughout a city is maybe a factor to the less relationship churches are having with each other? And that a church that used to be in one part of the town is now on each other side of the towns? And do you think that might be causing less interaction and healthy relationship conversations? Pastor Joe, I love your church. Uh, Jim Kuykendall is a good friend of ours. Uh, and I think your comment is brilliant. I am going to go slice and dice the data for those that are multi-site and those that aren't to see if that relationship is there. And I think you are spot on that, 
that the more we're doing, we are doing all over town, the less likely we are to feel that need to cooperate with someone else, um, uh, to partner, to open up other doors. And, and yeah. multi-sites tend to be less and less, you know, Starbuck uh, similar in that, you know, th there's a dream center campus downtown in a hard hit economic area. Uh, the church across uh, campus across town has right. a you know, flavor and reaches a different economic class and so forth. I agree. Cause I sit on a couple of boards of a, of some of the larger, these churches with the multi-site and uh, hearing from friends in the city of those churches, there's a strain in the relationship because they used to be on one side of the town and now they're literally half a mile down on the same street. And uh, it's, it's, I think it's part of the, it's just part of that territorial line from the old Testament in the book of Joshua and, and all of the various things, how all that works. So I think it's an interesting, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Uh, indeed. Other questions? Or do you want to, you know, somebody throw down a big challenge to Bird. You know, tell him you think he's all, you know, he's all washed up. He didn't know what he's talking about. Oh, I love those. <laughs> Come on. I think it's. Well, Greg, while they're thinking, why don't we why go don't we to the final slides and you uh, tell them about three things Leadership Network's doing. I've already told you about the salary survey at leadnet.org slash salary. Give that to your numbers first and you will be glad you did. We give you all kinds of helpful feedback and this year we're even adding local demographics in our feedback to you. Leadnet.org slash salary. Greg. You want to pull the slides up, Warren? I, ju I just did. Oh, I'm looking at it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what the rest of them. All right. I'm looking at it. It's looking great. Uh, uh, okay. Let me do share screen. Okay. There we go. Um, just a couple of things just to remind you of. Some of you are already involved with some of these things, but we just started our new team experience we call The Hub. Um, the Hub is a 12-month, uh, program gives you the opportunity to meet three times around a, a certain topic. So these are some of the topics you see on the screen. We, uh, we just actually are at capacity with our multi-site group, but we're adding churches to city impact and discipleship, generous churches, leadership development, millennials, nuns, the next generation, a variety of topics we'll be launching over the course of the year. Uh, the other thing that's really unique about the hub is not only do you have the opportunity to connect with churches around a particular topic, but all these are going on same time, same place. So, for example, in April, multi-site, city impact, uh, generous churches and leadership development topics are all going at the same time. And so not only are you having opportunity to engage with other churches in your topic area, but then also the other churches that are present in experience. We'll have about 50 to 55 churches, uh, close to 300 leaders in the room. And so it's a great experience and opportunity for you to bring your team. We really feel like the hub is kind of a dream accelerator, the things that you're working on, and uh, to be exposed to peers and other resources can kind of help you take it to the next level. We also are um, individual uh, leader groups. I think, Warren, that's the next slide. Sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Yeah. So a variety of leader groups. Some of you have been a part of our next gen groups. We're continuing those. Those are for these are all individual leaders, not teams. Um, to your experience, and you can read more about each of those at leadnet.org forward slash leader groups. But we're doing uh, in addition to next gen pastors this year, we're doing senior pastor next steps. Those are over 42 churches of 2,000 and more. And um, then we're also going to add in two new leader groups, uh, executive pastors and also campus pastors. Those are going to be some great opportunities uh, for individual uh, experiences as well. Yeah, you guys are all a part of the 400 churches, those churches that, as I mentioned, the front end of the call, uh, that we really feel like are churches that are going to be driving the conversations and the shaping what happens in the church over the next decade. And just want you to be sure and save the date uh, for our four, next 400 gathering. We're going to be September 27th to 28th at Church of the Highlands in Birmingham, um, Alabama. 
and lots of great opportunity to network with other leaders. Uh, Chris will be with us. Um, he'll be speaking as well as some other um, you know, so you'll hear more about in the days to come, but wanted you to be sure and have those dates on your calendar for September. Okay, any other questions you have for Dr. Bird or for me? I, I really don't have a question. It's more of something I'm just curious um, if there's anything else kind of, uh, I don't even know. Uh, so I'm a part of a mainline denomination. Yeah. And one of the exciting things right now, multi-site wise, is it's a sad, it's a sad, it's a sad fact, but also something that's exciting. It, the sad state is that there's churches all over in major cities that are closing their doors and are now empty buildings and are turning into museums. Um, but the exciting end of it is all we, uh, the Methodist Church owns property all over the place. And so it's all these potential campuses where uh, a building's already fully paid for. And so I'm just curious to see about what that looks like as far as just on a, on a bigger scale. So yeah, the great, great book. Yeah, Adam, I, th I would say United Methodists have done more with this merger idea and Ginghamsburg, a great case in point. Uh, uh, how many churches, I think at least three or four that, that were the district superintendent said, I'm going to close this unless would you like to do something with it? And Ginghamsburg has just infused uh, muscle energy, uh, talented leadership, commitment, prayer, not necessarily in that order and uh, seen just wonderful revitalization. In fact, games where it's got a conference coming up roots or something to that effect. Uh, rooted. Rooted. Uh, yes. Tell us about it. Yeah, we have a rooted conference coming up specifically for yeah. tree planting um, and really uh, around these areas of not just like multi-site, but also these possibilities of um, being part of kind of a rooted network and that kind of thing. It's uh, April 19th and 20th, um, and we've got stuff on our website, ginghamsburg.org, that you can take a look at. Um, Thanks. Thank you. Adam, was that what you were asking about? Uh, because this better together making mergers work, uh, one out of three, more than one out of three multi-site campuses come by way of merger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, for me, I've... I've never seen a greater opportunity before me. I mean, as a, as a person who has a heart for the lost and an entrepreneur spirit, I mean, we're, we're looking at how can we launch three or four campuses potentially a year. Um, and right now we have folks from Sioux City reaching out to us in Iowa and Fargo, North Dakota. Um, Des Moines has been thrown out to us, a second campus in the cities. I mean, it's just, there's just so much potential. I just... Huh. I've never been more excited. I just, it's just, and, and that's just in bigger communities. And um, where I'm at, there's, there's churches that are fully paid for all over North and South Dakota and Minnesota. And I, it's just amazing. Just the, the potential and possibility. I've never, man, it just, it, it's, it's crazy. It's just like, there's all kinds of combines just laying out in the fields full of wheat. And it's just like, will someone get behind that combine and just start driving that thing. So mm -hmm. Adam, that's a great analogy. And uh, last year we did a report on uh, multi-site churches. We had 525 multi-site churches uh, give input and you can get that for free. Go to leadnet.org and then in the search box, three forward scorecard. Uh, but one of the questions we ask at somebody's prompting, all, all our surveys are based on somebody saying, why don't you ask this? Why don't you ask that? Was, is you have one or more campuses in a smaller or more rural R-U-R-A-L area and like two thirds. Yes. Hmm. So this idea of merging with a more outpost city where the population has changed uh, is, is a reality for large yeah. churches as well. Yeah, and there's, a, there's some great models uh, for rural uh, models of multi-site as well. Andy Addis at Cross Point Church in Kansas, they've got 13 or 14 campuses the largest community they're, that they're in is Hutchison, which I think is about 40,000. And they're in communities that Andy says, we have more people coming to church that are on the city population sign when you drive into the city. Um, just some real great stories of restoration and redemption of facilities and lives and all kinds of things. So some great things there. Hey, Warren, you mentioned um, that all your surveys are driven by people saying, hey, would you ask this? Maybe we should ask that question here. Is there a question that any of you have? 
you're curious about uh, that Warren can add to his list as we continue to shape new research. Can I take you back to the, the merger issue? I'm wondering if you guys have done anything on just on that process. So, you know, specifically, I'm thinking about alignment. You've got an existing church. It's, it's waning, possibly. They've got facility, but they want to merge. You know, how do you, how do you get them aligned with the vision of the church that's really moving forward? Yeah, we haven't have done that. I've seen it, and I know it works. I, I, um, I've heard of it, but I just, I'm curious about that. In the book, Better Together, Making Mergers Work, we tried to probe that and, and uh, three levels on that. First, we, we use the language of the lead church and the joining church. Mm -hmm. The old model, which Lyle Schaller uh, researched and found it absolutely fails, is two churches sharing the best of each other, and they, they both end up holding hands and dying together. In right. Both. It's got to be one church with a clear, strong DNA, and the other church, the joining church, says, you know, I want to become like you. I will take your name, in essence, or I will take your DNA. And while we use the word merger, in the business term, it's a total acquisition. In biblical terms, it's death, burial, and resurrection. And I can't tell you how many stories we hear of people, you know, we were a 167 year old church. We had reached the gospel in this community. We were the leader. We can't do it anymore. We want a new chapter. If you will come in and bring Jesus front and center to our community, here are the keys. And we are willing to give up our men's pancake breakfast and everything else uh, to become like you. And, and there, there can be, and is a real win-win frequently there. There's also, you can be uh, harsh and insensitive and alienate and and not care, but it is being done continually where that alignment happens. And the alignment, as uh, Craig Rochelle and others say, the more clear you are with this is what we are, and your staff is not going to stay. I mean, you may apply for another position elsewhere in our church, but we're changing the staff, we're changing the leadership, we're changing everything in order to realign you with our vision. Okay. A couple of resources. Um, there's a woman whose name is Christy Rudder. She's on staff at the chapel um, in the Chicago area. And um, she actually helped them in their merger process and has actually developed uh, some skills and tools to be able to help identify potential merger candidates and help make some of those initial matches. Um, and I can, I'll be happy to, we'll send a follow up email. Uh, to this with a link to the video. I'll include Christy's uh, contact information if you want to touch base with her. Another church that does a really great job at mergers is Woodside Bible Church in Detroit. And um, they would, they, they're a little bit of an exception uh, because it, just as Warren said, all the staff has to go, everything has to be clean slate, clean slate, clean slate. They've done a really effective job of um, it's a little bit more of a come alongside. It's definitely a church that's, that's in need and wants to connect with them, but they also have done a great job of embracing what the history of that church and figuring out the good connection points of the history of that congregation into their story. Um, and so I think there's some great things you could learn from Woodside as well. And I'll include a contact information for that. Another 400 churches in uh, Morristown, New Jersey called Liquid church and on their website they have the story of their merger with 150 plus year old church and how just amazingly well it went yeah we're, we're right now we're we're four months into um what what you what we're talking about with a church four and a half hours away from our our teaching campus and um i think the main thing that i learned was just being very upfront and under promising so yes. i mean it's just and not in a rude way, but it was almost like a funeral when we met with them and just, we're not going to give you a sales pitch. We're not going to make it sound better than it will be. Like you will not exist as a church any longer, but can we use this room? Can we still do this one ministry? I'm so sorry. Like again, we, we can't force you to vote one way or another. We just want to give you the clear picture. And it's so cool. I was up there for the first time on a Sunday um, three weeks ago. And one of the main people who was really against it came up to me and the congregation was probably an average age of 70, 80 years old. The main person against it came up to me and, and hugged me and thanked me over and over and over again for 
for what had happened. The, a church of 60 is now a church of this last Sunday, we were over 350. Hmm. And, um, it's just, they're just thrilled about seeing people in and, and I honestly believe in the next year, we'll see it just grow and grow and grow and grow. So it's just getting off the ground. Yeah. And that's one of my favorite stories in the Better Together book, a Long Island Church, where the, a lady from the joining church was crying and the new campus pastor went over and said, what's, are you okay? And she said, I never thought God would fill this place again in my lifetime. And I yeah. am so happy. Yeah. Amazing. And there's some great, some great stories along those same lines in terms of kind of going back to honoring the history of the church. I mean, almost, um, I mean, as I said, I sort of say almost, but actually literally some churches will actually do kind of a final service. It's like a memorial service. And it's not a, you know, it's not so much about death, but it's about all the incredible things that God has done in that congregation through the years and about the opportunity you know, now for that to, for that legacy to continue in a new way. So cool stuff. Thanks. Hey, questions that you want Warren to research? Anybody? Or other questions you have for Warren or observations or things you want to talk about? Yeah, maybe, you know, on my personal behalf, you should uh, do some research on how do those guys over 50 actually stay, <laughs> stay, stay innovative and fresh and, you know, help their churches move forward. You know, that is a great idea. Brian, um, because the average, well, right now, I think Charles Stanley at age 82 is the largest senior uh, megachurch pastor. The average megachurch pastor age is 54, uh, and, and that is very close to the average age of all pastors in the United States, Protestant, which is 51. Uh, but that age for everybody is going up as you know we're able to live longer be healthy longer and so forth so i think you raise a great question uh I'm well you know kidding. i've seen youth you know guys work with youth into their 50s they're just doing, but they're the exception you know where they really stay uh able to connect to that generation i've seen it a little bit in college ministry as well but um you know your comment about the senior team in a sense the ages with the pastor and so the only senior pastor the only voices that he is listening to are those that are of his, his generation you can see how that'd be just a really easy, subtle trap to fall into. Yeah. Brian, you're number two and number three preacher. Uh, how many years uh, younger than you are they? They are about 10 years younger than I am. Awesome. So they're 40. And then, you know, we, we have some guys who are, who are teaching in our college ministries, which, you know, have anywhere from, you know, 300 to 700 in their gatherings. Um, you know, those guys are in their 30s and one of them in his 20s. So, you know, we're trying to keep that pipeline moving yep. forward. And that's that's crucial. Yeah. yeah, I'd say one more, one more, I'll do a shameless plug, uh, but those leader gatherings, that one for Senior Pastor Next Steps, I mean, that's a great way for, you know, to stay engaged with, other guys who are trying to figure out some of those things and um, learn, you know, figure out how they stay fresh. And uh, just the simple fact of being in, in that kind of peer relationship uh, might be a good fit as well. Okay. We said uh, 45 minutes and we are at 1046. So unless somebody else has a, another question, we're going to go ahead and sign off. It's great to see your faces and hear your voices for those of you who weren't on video and, uh, we're going to continue to do these kind of things if this is helpful for you. Um, and um, as always, know that uh, I'm a phone call, email, text away. Anything I can do to to support you, I'm happy to do that. And in fact, I'd love to pray for you um, as we conclude today. Father, thank you so much for those leaders that are gathered um, together literally around the country uh, and the congregations that they serve and the ministries that they lead. And I pray for them that you would continue to give them vision and courage and strength um, and insight and uh, creativ creativity and uh, freshness of thought uh, as they continue to lean into the ministry that you've given them to do. I thank you for their calling. I thank you for, thank you for the calling you have on each of our lives. I pray you would never allow us to take that for granted, that we would always be reminded of the great privilege that is and the great responsibility that is. I pray that each would uh, be surrounded by a group of 
leaders that can support and encourage and love them and speak truth into their lives um, and encourage them and be on their team. And I just thank you for the fact that you call them to the place that they are. And we trust you to uh, lead them in the way that you would have them to lead those that they serve. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Warren. Great. Great to chat with you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.